Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listeners. This is Brett. I'm the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast, and you are about to hear part one of two in Scott and Carl's discussion of Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove. And this conversation features Brett McKay from The Arts of Manliness. Before the word epic was rendered meaningless and pointless by people using it to describe everything they like, it would have been a fitting description for this 1985 Western novel and even the TV miniseries that followed shortly after. And over the next couple of weeks, since it inspired an, dare I say, epic conversation between Scott Carl and Brett, it is, as usual now, split into two parts. So make sure you check back for the concluding hour next week. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Here we go. I'm Scott Hamburg. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we are going to be discussing Lonesome Dove, Larry McMurtry's thing. Um, (laughs) This show has been about two years, a year and a half in the making. Carl read it back when we first thought we were going to discuss it. I I don't know. I think he listened to it a second time. I don't know. Then I just finished it up. And we we did this because it's one of Brett McKay of Art of Manliness. This This is his favorite books. Is that true, Brett? It's my favorite book. It, it, oh, wait a minute. Your favorite book. Not one of them. My fav- I'm going to say like favorite novel. Wow. Favorite fictional novel. I've read it five times, probably in the past 12 years. Named my firstborn after Augustus McRae. Wow. I like that book. I like the book that much. Wow. Yeah. What's your favorite book that's not Lonesome Dove? Uh, does it have to be like, what are we looking at? I have different like favorites and different things you just have to pick one i just have to pick one mm-hmm. i don't know i keep going back to nick and mckeon ethics okay i go back there good choice philosophy if i had to pick that uh and then like other fiction i like great gatsby i enjoy that one a lot Brad. i can't think of any My, like the, I, I hate the question like what's your favorite book <laughs> it's like because a- it changes like it changes like i'm a, like i'm a different person like scott like I know, at one time in your life, Catch Twenty Two was your all-time favorite novel. And if I asked you, Scott, is Catch Twenty Two still your favorite book? What would you say? It is not. Yeah. Yeah, it was like what was my favorite stuff ten years ago, or three years ago? I can't. It's hard for me to decide well, what it is now. We just did a show on Beethoven, and the Fifth Symphony is my favorite, but so is the Third, and Number Six, and Number Nine. Yeah. They're all my favorite. Yeah, but I, I can't say well definitively. Larry uh, Lonesome Dove. All-time favorite novel. And I will probably read it again a few more times before I die. Heavy talk. Heavy talk. Yeah. We have read, and we're going to talk about that one. So if you haven't read it, there will be spoilers, as always, because we don't care about that stuff. I watched the miniseries whenever that was. 88? I don't know. Yeah, it's like 88, 89. Yeah, and I, I, the only thing I remembered about was the guy getting, you know, all snake bit and everything. That's really the only thing I remembered. But uh, I remember the, Diane Lane. Well, the book's <laughs> quite different. So if you've watched the miniseries and you think you're going to know, you know what we're talking about here, they're entirely different. Uh, so you should go go ahead and read the book. As always, go ahead and read the book. A lot of poking in here. I was like Brett McKay. <laughs> <laughs> we got to explain what poking is. A lot of talk about carrots and poking. Carrots and poking. Turnips. <laughs> yeah. My turnip. So weird. <laughs> it's vulgar. Uh, it's earthy. I, I'm not earthy. We'll say earthy. So McMurtry wrote this book called Lonesome Dove. And it's about a couple of retired Texas Rangers who are essentially Indian fighters and um, quasi-outlaws themselves, as far as I can tell, who settle down in this little dump of a town on the border. And McMurtry paints this picture of a world that is really popul- only populated by men. Only is a, a big word because there are female characters in it, but most of the world of McMurtry and Lonesome Dove is populated by men. Most of the women that are in here in this book are sporting women. Sporting. They play field hockey. They play pocket pool. No, they're <laughs> prostitutes. They're prostitutes. They live above the saloon. They're broken ladies, like Larry Gatlin would say. 
I would say all the people in this book are broken. Is Newt broken? He becomes broken. Whoa. When he goes and visits a sporting lady, is that what broke, what broke him? No, <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of, you know. Uh, well, he doesn't know who his dad is, or he, he knows, finds out, but he never gets the recognition. We're skipping to the end. That's we're we skipping. We're skipping to the very end of the book. <laughs> yeah, so it's a world of men. There are some women in in the book, but it's really about men being dudes. But McMurtry, I I don't really like the world that he paints. Like I love a western. I love a cowboy story. I love an adventure, but McMurtry's world is not one that I want to live in. Yeah, and he, I mean, I think to get some context, he purposely did that. Uh, one of the, his goals with Lonesome Dove was to write a Western that wasn't your typical Western, where you didn't mythologize. He wanted to kind of get away from the, the myths of the American West, where white guys and, you know, the good guys in the white hat and the bad guys in the black hat. And where everyone's kind of, it's ambiguous. You know, like you said, these former Texas Rangers kind of outlaws breaking the law they're sort of working on the edge they're not they're not good and he even admits that he's like these aren't supposed to be like paragons of morality but the interesting thing is is people love this book he got frustrated with it because people viewed it as sort of this mythologized romantic story of the west but i think scott you actually you caught on to what mcmurtry was trying to do and it, you always you don't like it but like you got it like you you caught on to it yeah i it's I complain about this all the time. If you're a philosopher and you want to publish something, there's been so much published, you're going to have to get weird. And the chances of you coming up with something new and true is very slim. So people get weird and they publish all kinds of stuff that's garbage. <laughs> How about that? So if you want to do it, if you want to do something new with the Western genre, you're going to have to diverge from what it had traditionally been, just like you said. And I, and I Look, I get that, but I turn to my Westerns for an idealism, for a heroism, you know, for a picture of good and for a picture of what freedom best lived looks like and, and, and so on. And, and that, that ain't in here. It's a good story, and I liked it, by the way, but you, you don't pick this book up for the same reason you pick up uh, Louis L'Amour. No, for sure. But the problem, I mean, so the problem with Louis L'Amour, I love Louis L'Amour. Stories are great, but it's like if you read one Louis L'Amour book, you read them all. Like I, I was on this cruise with my wife a long time ago and you know, the, all these cruise ships, they have like a library and I was bored. So I went down there and they just had this whole just column of Louis L'Amour books. And I read probably 12 of them. There's the other, there's super easy, quick reads. And I was like, every story, this is, I just read the same story 12 times, just different characters. Yeah, but I need to read that story 12 times. You need times. to read that. Well, okay, here's, okay, I will, I will concede that uh, this is not, uh, you're not going to find uh, an ideal in this book. But what I, what I do think this book does a good job of, I think this is one of Mer Mertry's themes, if you see it throughout all of his fiction, is just how do you deal with uncertainty? That's what, like, this whole thing is every character is dealing, like, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? in this situation. Okay. Mm. You know, kid, you're crossing across this, this river and your brother gets, uh, your Irish brother gets you know, bitten by water moccasins and dies. Like, what do you do? Like you're, you're thousands of miles away from home. You're not any near town. What are you supposed to do? You see a lot of the characters struggling, trying to figure out what to do in all this uncertainty. Uh, like July Johnson is the perfect example of that. He's Luke Skywalker. He's a, I don't like he's July. A, he's one of the. I don't like him. He's a walking error. But he's an interesting character because I'm trying to figure out what his deal is. What why? So for those of you, okay, I think we got to backtrack. So there's this is a complex <laughs> story because yes. we're we're like we're mentioning all these names. So just to give you, I think I think it'd be good to do a big picture overview of the narrative. So it's an epic narrative, like Scott said. You have these former Texas Rangers. They have a ranch on the border of Mexico and Texas. One day, one of their former ranger buddies comes in and says, hey, there's a lot of uh, great land up in Montana. And Woodrow Call, one of the rangers who is kind of the straight man here, just always duty bound, whatever. He decides, well, we're going to go to Montana. We're going to do the cattle drive. So that's the main narrative is the cattle drive from Lonesome Dove up to Montana, the Canadian border. But there's also these other narratives that get brought in. So you have this one narrative starts off in Fort Smith, Arkansas, character by name July Johnson. His brother gets killed by 
one of these former Texas Rangers that was buddies with the main characters. He's got to go chase him down. Uh, meanwhile, his wife gets down the Arkansas River, runs away from him. He has to then he has to go chase his wife along the Arkansas River. And then the other narrative is you've got uh, Clara Allen, who is Augustus McRae's one of the main characters, uh, former love. She's in Nebraska, and all these stories come together and meet up into one thing. So that's it is kind of hard to keep track of sometimes because you got you're going jumping from this set and this set. it's it's like you're watching an episode of Downton Abbey basically <laughs> I mean there's just like different storylines you have to keep track of Downton uh, Abbey with whores Downton Abbey with whores <laughs> so it's a cattle drive and it's a cattle drive yeah I had to think about it what do they think there's nine big rivers how many rivers they need to cross. You have uh, to think, see. if you look on the map from Texas to Montana on foot, people used to do this kind of thing. Yeah, the Pecos, uh, the Red River. They had, well, they had to cross the Rio Grande, which is more of a, it's not a big river, it's just trickle. The Platte was another one. Yeah, there's a lot of rivers. A lot of rivers. So when I, singing about this novel, uh, I, I read it and then I read... Uh, I forget the title. That book about the Comanche that you recommended, Brett. Oh, uh, The Empire of the Summer Moon? Yeah, and I read that, and that, then I listened to the book again. I listened to the audiobook. It, McCray and Call are a lot more understandable as characters when you understand what Texas was like in, say, 1860. Yes. I'd agree with that. That, uh, I mean, there were people being stolen off farms by the Plains Indians, and the Comanche were not nice. And and so Colin McRae are not nice. You know, they're brutal men that brought order. So for me, it wasn't necessarily about uncertainty. For me, it's it's a novel about the border of civilization. Yeah, but the border's gone past these guys, but they don't like it. Well, and then Call has to go back to the edge, you know. So for that means going way, way north, this unsettled land in Montana. Yeah, it's out of character that he decides to go on a cattle drive. He's never done it before. Well. And Jake Spoon says, well, there's good land up there, so why does he go? Because he, he has to live outside of society. Before all the bankers and, and uh, school marms show up. Yeah, on page 82, Augustus says, uh, speaking about Call, he says that he didn't have to go along establishing law and order and making it safe for bankers and Sunday school teachers like we done. I guess that's why you're ready to head off to Montana. You want to help establish a few more banks. Like Augustus knows, like, wherever they go, I think they want to live in this place where they can act as they as they please. And they have a notion of what's right, you know, to the point that they'll hang their own friend for stealing horses. He had it coming. And they want to be able to act in the way that they think they should act without answering to anybody. But Augustus knows that, you know, they are as uncivilized as they are, and as brutal as they are, they are civilizers. It's, and then they'll make wherever they are unfit for themselves eventually. <laughs> Yeah, and th for me, that's the, the tragedy of these two people is if they do their job right, they become unwelcome. I don't want to get political at all, but we have this a lot of historical revisionism now where we're looking at people in the past and judging them adversely because they did things that, well, we wouldn't do in the civilized lands that we live because they went and civilized them. Yeah. So they got to go for a long walk to get to the frontier before it's all gone. Uh, So something we can do, it's kind of... Be an interesting discussion point. So McMurtry says, talking about Call and uh, McRae, he says that Woodrow Call is the Stoic and Augustus McRae is the Epicurean. Hmm. Agree or disagree? Hmm. I read hmm. where, where McMurtry says that. I don't see that Call is necessarily a Stoic. Call has a set of standards, and his main driving value, I think, is that of unattachment. And so maybe maybe he's Stoic in that, right? But at one point in his younger life, he spent time with a sporting woman, which is not something that he does. And he ends up with this child, Newt, who the, the mom, the prostitute, I think Maggie was her name, dies, Maggie, yep. or the young toddler boy is is orphaned and call and mccray take him in and call never acknowledges that he is his son he never overtly does it it's a that's a, one of the major themes of the book and call while he while he seems to be stoic 
I think that's just a result of his just refusing any sort of t- attachment. When they live in Lonesome Dove, the Hot, Hot Creek outfit, he doesn't stay. He doesn't sleep with them. Like he, he doesn't sleep in the bunkhouse. He sleeps outside every day after dinner. He jumps on the horse and rides like ten miles away and like looks for Indians that aren't there. It's avoidant per- <laughs> uh, <laughs> behavior. Does that make him stoic, or does a stoic? I hate stoicism. I can't believe you're making me talk about it. I'm going to make you. I knew you because I, I wanted to make. You, I'm gonna, I was going to use it. I'm going to get this to have talk. Scott talk about stoicism. So does a, does a proper stoic, whatever that is, does a proper stoic engage fully with life and attachments and relationships, and then when those things are harmed or go wrong, are they? Do they then turn their emotional back on it? Or does the proper Stoic avoid those things? See, I don't know. You know, I've read my Seneca and my Aurelius, and it's not clear to me how Aurelius would would treat one of his children. Like he says, oh, well, if your kid dies, he wasn't actually your kid anyway, and uh, onward and upward. You know, but but in the day-to-day relationship with the kid, did he treat him that way? Like, hey, you ain't mine. Here's enough food to not die. Yeah, I don't know that he's a capital S Stoic. He's He's Stoic. Yeah. With the adjective. Yeah, he's very he's very duty bound. Like he just he needs to have a duty. If he doesn't have it, then he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to enjoy himself. Like you know you never see him have a good time. Yeah, he doesn't have any relationships. Like if you don't if you don't have any relationships and you're so crippled up that you don't find joy in really anything, what else is there? It's like either complete nihilism, he's gotta be some you know, weird waspy work ethic and just bury himself in work, you know, dig wells by hand and you know. I don't know. Now, about McRae, I I don't know that I would call him an Epicurean either, just because the things that he does that are are not pursuit of pleasure, like chase Laurie across uh, the plains and rescue her, he's the one that does the most noble action in the book, I think. And I agree. Clara. Clara, would you say she's a Stoic? Well, I mean, noble action from Clara is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. You could say that uh, Augustus McRae is an Epicurean that, you know, his stance towards life is, how can I have a good time? I mean, he'd rather, like, he just went on the, like, he didn't want to go on the trip, but he figured, well, I've got nothing else to do, and it'll give me a chance to stretch my legs, Yeah, but maybe see Clara. But his friend is going. See, that's why I don't think, I think the Epicurean, if there is one, would be Jake, Jake Spoon. Sure. Yeah who seeks pleasure. Uh, He doesn't do it well. He's not a good Epicurean. He messes up. But he doesn't have any of these constraints of friendship, at least not very much. Aristotle's three levels of friendship, he has the very lowest one, the friendship of pleasure, mutual pleasure, or maybe use. Yeah. But McRae actually sees the value of cat and call. They never call him Captain McRae very much, Uh, which is interesting. The one's a captain, the other one isn't, even though they're both captains. (laughs) <laughs> it has to do with that their personality. But he sees with all of the sporting woman, the difference with, with McCray, he it isn't that he doesn't indulge, he does very much, but he uh, he treats them with respect. Yeah, he doesn't treat them merely as a means, he treats them also as an end. Like they're a human being. Like this is a person. Yeah, so I think that's a little bit a little bit beyond Epicureanism. I don't think he's Epicurean. He pursues these pleasures when there's really nothing else for him to do that he sees as virtuous. If uh, Blue Duck snatches up his women, then he's going to go to work and he's going to go make it right. But in lieu of that, you know, he's not he's not going to be uh, digging a ditch just to fill it back in later. He's more self. I think he's more self contained than Call is. You know, he can sit on a on his tuffet when there's nothing to do in that, that crappy town, frankly. And, uh, and maybe he's degenerate. Maybe he drinks too much in the evening. I mean, he probably does, but he offers genuine companionship actually to Lorena who he pays for sex, <laughs> but, but they also play cards together in McMurtry portrays her as somebody that has difficulty or maybe not difficulty, but doesn't want to converse with other people. And, and she wants to converse with him. He indulges himself, but I think it's only because he can't live out his true purpose, which is rangering. 
you know, mm-hmm. dishing out his kind of dishing out his kind of justice and and doing his type of work. yeah. So both of them in 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 action are somewhat deformed characters. Yes, they need to be out uh, making the world safe for bankers and school teachers, but there's no place to do that anymore. And so, Call is digging ditches and wells and and making uh, what's his name Dish dig a well when he just got hired to be a a, a cattle hand, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And McRae sits on on his barrel and drinks whiskey all day. They don't have their purpose. The purpose is gone. So for me, that's really kind of melancholy. That makes me think about masculinity in general. You know, what do you do when there's no one to fight or marry? Nothing to yeah. build. Yeah, there's settled. no one to marry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, well, the thing men. is, the fighting might have made them unsuitable for the marrying. Yes. Th- that's possible. Yeah. I mean, that's basically uh, why Clara never marries Augustus. I mean, one of the reasons. Well, she's she's afeard that that they would be the ones fighting, I think. Yeah. They're too powerful. The band doesn't need two lead guitar players, Brett. And if they got married, there'd be two lead guitar players. Is is there a virtuous character in this book? You were right about Clara. I think she's the most virtuous. She's motherly in a good way. Yeah, I think Clara's virtuous. I think Newt has the potential to be, and we start to see it at the end. I haven't read any of these other uh, the other books, so there are, there are more in this series. So presumably, we get more of Newt's story. Deets is a good character. Deets is a good character. Deets is a good guy. Loyal. That was the saddest part. What happens to Deets? I won't say anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but speaking of uh, Newt, like in the ne- in the next book, in the the sequel, doesn't work out well for Newt, oh, yeah. and it's it's pretty sad. Well, I'm, I think I'm not going to read it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to have him have a happy ending. Maybe we ought to talk about some of these other characters. So July Johnson. Yeah, let's talk about July. I don't like July, but he's one of the characters I think about all the time. I I think it's because I don't like him. He's Luke Skywalker. Like, he's in the position to be the hero, but he can't do it. He's not sufficient to it. He can't do it. And he's a mincing. Well, why is that? What's wrong with July? I mean, it seems like July had... A decent, like, he's not like these guys, these, uh, he's not like Woodrow or Augustus. He grew up in Fort Smith, which sounds like it was, you know, besides hanging Judge Parker that was there. Uh, it seemed like it was pretty tranquil. He just kind of had to, just had to take care of drunk guys. It seemed like he came from a decent family, uh, but he's incompetent as a man. What happened? I think he's civilized. When he gets to the outskirts of civilization, he's not equal to the task. So he's kind of the opposite of McCray and Call, who are uncivilized and have a hard time in town. Oh. Like uh, the scene when they go into the bar and McCray uh, breaks the nose of the bartender. Right. So July Johnson, he's living in Fort Smith. Everything, he needs civilization. And so Jake Spoon comes in and accidentally kills the dentist. Who is his brother. His brother. And so, um, Peach, <laughs> an unpleasant Peach. character, yep. Peach says, you need to go hunt him down. He doesn't really want to. And so he starts on this adventure, which he's just, he's just not capable of doing it. When they encounter Blue Duck, I hate that scene. I mean, it's a very good scene. It's very well written, but I hate it when he sees McCray go through and just kill six of the bad guys in a few seconds and he does nothing and the only thing that happens is the people he's traveling with get killed yeah but but is that because he's civilized or he just doesn't have the sort of the force of will that that call him mckay mccray he has he doesn't have a concept of what violence is actually like i think it could be both he's not capable i don't think he's even capable of it because even when he's in civilized situations uh people can sense his uh ineptitude like even Clara, he, you know, so there's a moment where July ends up in Nebraska and he hangs out, lives with Clara for a while. And she she even gets annoyed by him because he does, doesn't know how to like interact with people or with a woman in particular. And like his first wife was the same sort of thing. Just like, man, you are just not a pleasant man. Like I, they there's like just a lot of con- people just have like a lot of contempt for him. This book is full of these betas, man. Like 
not in the like <laughs> I don't know Jocko Willink sense. Like there are these like these kind of blue pill guys that just don't know how to deal with these women. They have a conception of what they're like, but they don't have enough experience with them to, you know, to test their conception of them and then to interact with them properly. Like July wants Clara, but before that, he's got this horrific uh, ex-prostitute sociopath wife, Elmira, who is probably the worst character in the book. Outside of Blue Duck, maybe worse than Blue Duck, actually. <laughs> like, leaves her child to die, abandons another one. Yeah. She is absolutely disgusting. And he's married to her, but he can't see that. Like, he can't see her for what, he, what, what she is. He, he has, uh, he's projected, you know, what he wants on her. And when he has evidence, all the evidence to the contrary, he can't, he can't let it go. Uh, his trusted uh, sidekick and goofy deputy, Roscoe, comes and hunts him down and says, hey, listen, uh, she left on a whiskey barge, which would have been with the roughest people on the fringes of the society. And he's like, oh, i got to go find her. Like, Wait a minute. She wouldn't talk to you. She wouldn't move. She sat on the edge of the loft and kicked her feet all day. Your best friend, such as he is, has told her, you that she ran off with a bunch of buffalo hunters and whiskey traders and just went up the river. She told you to take her only son, didn't even bat an eye or see you out the door, give you a kiss on the ch- cheek, and you're going to go drop everything and go chase this skank. Like He's nuts. But he's married to her. So this is a, a point in his favor, I think, that he goes to, to try to find her. Well. He has a strong sense of duty. He has a strong sense of duty. He has a very poor judge of character. And then the other issue that I just I just find frustrating with July is he doesn't he's always he's always saying, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? And he, he always looks to others other people to tell them like at a certain but I mean, okay, to his credit, so when you watch the miniseries, uh who's the actor that plays July Johnson? He just looks he looks like he's in his thirties, but July Johnson's actually in the book, I think 24. he's supposed to be in his twenty four. So he's yeah. a young kid basically. Um, so he's not like Augustus and Woodrow who are probably in their fifties yeah. at this point. So he's, he's, he's wet behind the ears, but at the same time, I mean, there's a point where even if you, you don't know what you do, you have to at least act like you do. Well, and that's also a different world. You know, he's been a full grown man since he's, I don't know, 16, right? 15, 16, 17. Yeah. And then what was McRae and, and uh, Spoon and call doing when they were his age. They were joining the Rangers. They were getting it done, whatever that happened to be. And the, and this guy doesn't do it. He's he's just he's just broken. Dish and his infatuation with Arena is ridiculous and pointless. It's a pining for something like he doesn't even know know her. He's seen her. He threw ten dollars her way for a poke one time or something. I don't know. Two dollars, I think. Two dollars. And then it's just this infatuation with this idea of this person he doesn't know. I'm like in in the same thing with the July and Elmira. I'm like, what are you guys doing? So I was really concerned about because because you know, McMurtry is painting all these I don't know, less than virtuous characters, these incomplete people. And all throughout the book, Augustus Gus is talking about Clara and these callbacks, his relationship with Clara. And I'm like, oh, gosh, if we get up there and she's another one of these, you know, scandalous whores, I'm going to be wrecked. I'll throw this book away. (laughs) But she's not. Yeah, I don't know. I still think uh, July would have done better. I don't know. He would have done better in Boston (laughs) than on the frontier. It's easy to read a Western and say, well, the character should have done this in this situation. Gosh, I wouldn't know what to do either. Right. No. And one thing I, I'm so, uh, Carl, you know, that scene where, you know, Gus kills like six, six guys and, uh, July can't even get a, sh- a shot off. You know, one of the interesting things I thought there was like how much, I wouldn't say compassion, but like M- Gus didn't like rub it in his face. Like Gus understood like, man, this guy, he wasn't, he wasn't made for this world. And he said that like, you shouldn't feel bad about this. Uh, you just need to move on and get back to your people and don't try to be a hero. 
because you're not going to do, you're probably going to, he didn't say you're going to fail, but it's like, it's just not your place to do. But like he, Gus said it in a way that wasn't like contemptuous, mm-hmm. which I think, uh, again, that's one of the reasons I like Gus. Yeah. He knows what some people are capable of and he'd seen others that weren't capable of that. And uh, Spoon is one of those. Jake Spoon is one of those that weren't in ca- weren't capable of doing what needed to be done sometimes. The thing that they didn't like about Spoon, the difference between him and July is a spoon continued to put himself in the position to need those skills or that force of will or that ability to act that he did not have. Yeah. I've, this is something I've, okay. Yeah. I think this is a good segue because this is a question I've had for a long time. Every time I read this book, I, I, every time I read it, I feel like Jake spoon and July Johnson are the same in a lot of ways, but hmm. different. Cause if you, if you read their dialogue, they're always talking about circumstance. It's like, well, I'm just, I don't like the circumstance just put me in this situation and I don't know what to do. Like Jake, he's always like, well, the dentist just got in the way. It wasn't my fault. Or, you know, it's always external circumstances are to blame. And July is kind of the same way, but he, he feels, I guess the difference is, is he feels a certain responsibility. Like he has a conception that he should know what to do, uh, how to react to these external circumstances but he doesn't know how to do it. Yeah, Jake is content to uh, let things happen. He doesn't think he has to do anything except find a pretty girl and 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 win at cards. July Johnson, but neither of them know quite what to do, but July Johnson thinks he needs to. Yeah. Jake is a gambler, and he's always talking about luck, yep. about his bad luck, and then he has good luck, and he has bad luck. And, and uh, he doesn't actively choose. July knows he doesn't actively choose. Like he stands at the fork in the road and says, I don't know what to do. And then Jake just, just does stuff. And then Dennis gets shot and horses get stolen and settlers get killed and prostitutes get abducted. And you know, he's, he's terrible. And they should have hung him when he walked into town the first time <laughs> instead of waiting until the eight, page 800 or whatever. Yeah. I think that's, and I'm, I'm sure we've all encountered people like that. Oh Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Brutus. Well, bad luck. It's just bad luck. Just bad luck. I have a friend. He's not He's not quite like Jake Spoon, but everything always works out for John. That's his name. And it does, you know, and he, like, he'll leave for the airport a half an hour before the airplane's going to take off. It's no problem. Everything always, and it does, darn it. He'll He'll show up there and the plane will be late and he'll make it on the plane and it always works out for him. And I think Jake was probably lucky. And it was bad for his character. He was lucky until he wasn't. He was yeah, lucky. That... He, uh, for a man like him to be with with Colin McRae, that's the right people for him to be with, because they have the virtues that he lacks. This goes back to Machiavelli, the prince, right? Mm. It's uh, that's one of the, the things he noted is that princes who uh, are successful by chance or fortuna, they actually end up doing worse because they didn't develop virtue. So when bad times fall or when bad times come, you, the, the lack of virtue is revealed. It's certainly revealed. Yeah. Jake, Jake's awful. Jake and Elmira and blue duck are just terrible villains. Yeah. So speaking of Elmira, whenever I, what's nice about lonesome dove, uh, that I like about it too, is like, it's in my part of the country, Mm -hmm. right? So Texas and they, they go through Oklahoma you know, Elmira starts in Fort Smith. She gets on the Arkansas on that whiskey barge. Whenever I drive by the Arkansas River, I've said, I think to myself, Elmira probably was on that whiskey barge right here at 71st Street. <laughs> right. I, I think that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. We'll back up even more. Texas becomes a republic, and then it gets adop- uh, taken into the Union. And uh, sometime, it seems like, it's not all clear to me, but it seems like sometime around that time, McRae and Call start doing their work as rangers and uh, hunting Indians down and trying to tame some of the far reaches of Texas. Then you have the Civil War. They stay in Texas during the Civil War. The governor says, hey, your duty is here. You're ex- you would be excellent soldiers, but we need you here. If all of the good soldiers leave Texas, the Indians are going to carry our cattle and our women folk away. Please stay. They do. The war is over. Texas is almost completely uh, open for settlement at this point. You know, not a lot of hostile Indian action and so on. 
that's where the show starts. The book starts. They had stopped rangering about 10 years ago. They took up this, um, some land outside of this fictional town called Lonesome Dove, and uh, they're stealing cattle from Mexico occasionally and selling those. Uh, McRae and, and uh, Call seem to have plenty of money. They seem mm-hmm. to have plenty of money, but we don't get to hear where this money came from. Uh, but they're stealing cattle when they want to sell a few cattle because, uh, you know, you can't steal from Mexicans. Right. I mean, I mean, apparently that's the ethic. You can't steal, you know, if it's over on the other border. I was a little offended by finding the, the Irishman in Mexico. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> the drunk Irishman. On the, on the donkey. Who don't even know that they need to soak the beans. Right. <laughs> before they eat them. They've been there in 10 years. Newt has been born. He's 16, 17 maybe. I don't know. Augustus and Call are there. Uh, some of the original Ranger crew is with them. Spoon drifts into town. He's accidentally killed a man screwing around with a buffalo gun, rifle in Fort Smith. He's fleeing the popo. He says, but you know, I've heard that Montana's nice at its frontier, and if a man could get up there with some cattle, it would be all his. Call decides that they're going to go do that. Meanwhile, July Johnson, the sheriff of Fort Smith, is being urged by his sister-in-law, Peach, to go find Spoon. He heads for South Texas. He's gone a good 38 minutes, and Elmira leaves with the whiskey barge. Peach, well, Roscoe, his deputy, who is loyal to Mr. Johnson, to Sheriff Johnson, uh, strikes out on his trail to let him know his old lady's run away. Right. So you were talking about you like that it's around and you're part of the area, but part of the world, you know? Me too. Yeah. So somewhere around what I think is Paris, Texas, <laughs> somewhere around Lamar County, he runs into this woman. <laughs> L- L- I think her name's Linda. Was it Linda? I, I know what you're talking. This scene didn't make it in the mir- miniseries. So he, he runs into this woman who's a widow woman, and she he just <laughs> he comes into this clearing, and there's this dude like wearing pants and a hat like mule skinning and pulling stumps and working and and he gets up closer it's a it's a chick and she gets on to him you know help you know damn you you know and he helps her pull a few stumps and she outworks him like he works with her for like an hour and a half and she he's just worn out and she just keeps on going takes her back he, she takes him back to the uh the cabin eats some cornbread and she says hey uh, my old man died uh, i think it was her third old man husband and she said, uh, you're a guy. I think you'll do. I'll make you a deal. <laughs> uh, and he's, he, he ain't for that. So he decides he's going to sleep outside. And she's like, hopefully that rattlesnake that's my pet won't get you. Well, he wakes up and the rattlesnake's nearby. But she shoes him off, the rattlesnake off. And she straddles him and uh, helps herself. And she's just completely competent. So the whole the whole thing is really kind of funny, and I picture it in Lamar County out there by Paris, Texas. Uh, but the whole thing's kind of funny. But then I'm like, wait a minute, this woman is entirely effective, where July and Roscoe aren't, and she's actually the only one that directly takes on establishing a relationship or a marriage or a romance or whatever you want to call it. She's the only one in the whole book that's just like, hey, I like you. I think this could work. Here's how we could do it. Let's go. I've put up with worse than you, you know? Right. She says, this is Louisa, by the way. Louisa, that's it. Uh, you men are a worthless race. You're good for a bounce now and then, but that's about it. I doubt you'd make much of a <laughs> farmer. You know, that's her opinion of men. Yeah. The men don't understand the women. The women don't understand the men. In this book, I think Just, women understand the men more than the other. Yeah, women. I think Clara understands the men, especially particularly Clara. Well, poor old Roscoe. He's like, well, I've got to go find my friend, the sheriff. So he rides off from her, but the whole time he's thinking, uh, I'm a little scared of her, but I might come back. And the whole time I'm thinking, stay, stay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, later on, Roscoe runs into this guy who's a little bit spooky, and then come to find out this guy has a 13-year-old girl that he paid for with some hides, with some skin. Mm, Janie. Janie. Ugh. And he, he keeps her in the, in, the, in the cabin for we knoweth not, you know? 
but he's a bad guy and uh, Roscoe sleeps outside and he can hear hollering and struggling and stuff inside and it doesn't sound good to him. But again, not being a man of action and being, doesn't do anything. Di- being dissolute, he just lays there and listens to this stuff, whatever it may be. Well, uh, well, and then he leaves. Well, he finds this 13-year-old girl. He's on horseback and she chases him down afoot. <laughs> and she's just dressed in rags. She's 13 years old. She feeds him. Like, like she just huck a rock at a rabbit and kill it. She's my it, favorite and then, character. And, like, just run down a rabbit until it was tired and then, like, bite it on the neck. <laughs> she's just a savage. But she's, comp- again, completely competent according to her own lights, right? Like, she doesn't need shoes. She doesn't need anything. She can make it happen. And the whole time I'm just like, Roscoe, take that girl back. You guys go back to the cabin and just build a life, you know, with that – what was her name? Louisa? Linda, Louisa, Lydia, yeah, go st- Janie is the young girl. I'm thinking, go back, go back. But these guys can't do it. They can't do it. None of them can. What is McMurtry doing? Like, I hear what you say. He's telling a good story. There's more than one way to do that. And I know that he's trying to uh, stretch or break the Cowboy and Western drama. But does does everybody have to be so dysfunctional? Like, can nobody have a conversation? Like, what the hell? You know, P.I. and Deets know each other for 25 years, and they've got a 400 words between them over the two and a half decades. Like, what is going on with these people? I don't know. Uh-huh. Maybe the people, a lot of people are like that. Well, I think that's probably true. I hope not. You know? Like, I mean, he's describing the world as it is. I mean, I, I know I, I, I'm not. I try not to be like that. But I think a lot of people are like that. Probably. They just don't know what they don't know what they like. What is good or what they even want, and so they end up like Roscoe or July, or Jake Spoon. And so the people that seem to know what's what are Clara and Louisa, who have established farms and work to be done. That's kind of interesting. That they're the two. Louisa is a comic character, and Clara is more of a tragic one. But uh, yeah, but like, uh, but uh, it works out well for Clara. I will say that in the the next one. Oh, in the mm. next one. Yeah, and in in, like in the uh, sequel, Streets of Laredo. It's kind of a letdown. See, you read Streets of. I mean, okay, all the other ones are good. They're not as good as Lonesome Dove, but it's interesting. The 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 sequel, you get to see what happens to these characters after the the cattle drive, and then before you get to see how they became who they are. That's either it's both good and bad. It kind of takes away. I don't know. You you kind of create things in your imagination of what you how you thought it would turn out, and McMurtry ruins it for you. Uh, <laughs> that's his prerogative. They're his characters, right? No, they're they're your characters now. <laughs> oh yes. Well, I mean, that's there's something to that. Not a not a happy book. No, but I, in a way, it is. It's kind of uh, like a Greek tragedy. In some instances, you just you don't know what the right thing to do is, and you're you're confronted with what am I supposed to do? I was thinking of the Odyssey, obviously, because it's a journey. But what really made me think of it was the scene towards the end, where you you don't really get to see Call in much action in this book. Whenever there's yeah. fighting to be done, it's McRae who does it. Uh, but it's when the U.S. Army is trying to take the horses. And one of the people starts beating up on Newt. Call just runs him down with a horse and drags him and starts beating on him. And it shocking display of violence. And I'm thinking, this is Odysseus and the suitors. Mm. Yeah. These civilized people don't know what's hit them when the, the guy that's been on the border his whole life actually gets into the action. They just, they don't know what to do. And it's, what does he say? I, I uh, something like, can't abide bad manners or something like that. Can't don't tolerate it. Yeah. Which you wonder, what did the suitors ever do that was so wrong? They invited themselves to a party and they wouldn't leave. Bad man. They violated Zania. Yeah. The sacred pact of Zania. The other reason I think about it, Odysseus gets home and now what's he going to do? You know, you wonder how long does he stay at home? Probably a day or two. <laughs> and then he's off. But he's got to take the ore and plant it in a place where people haven't heard of the sea. I bet he didn't stay there very long. And Call couldn't stay up in Montana. 
and what's he do after the end of the book? I don't, I suppose I could read the sequel and find out, but I can't imagine him staying still without a job to do. Becomes a bounty hunter. Does he? Yeah. He's too old for that. See, there's some improbable stuff in this book. Like, where did they get their money? I want to know. Like, they always had plenty of money. You know, Augustus is like, he gives the- Lori fifty dollars. I mean, yeah, and he's and he's got, they've all they've both Which got is like plenty of money. Twenty thousand now. Augustus Gus will not. He just frankly won't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's a principle of his which I can admire and he, he won't do it so they gather up somehow 3,000 horses 3,000 cattle get gathered up and they herd them up to uh, Montana or is it Wyoming it's Wyoming right, yeah half of the herd is Gus's like he didn't do what they didn't buy him he doesn't have any <laughs> capital in it he he did almost nothing to help them gather him up when it came time to do the cattle drive he just like rode in a wagon with essentially and uh, bedded down with Lorena every evening and didn't really help. Like what? How? What? I mean, I guess it's just because they're good friends and they're partners. I mean, period. Call Emma Cray are married. They're partners. They have a deal and it's a deal to the, to the end and that's fine. But it, but that part isn't really explained like I'd like it to be. I don't know. There has to be a reason why they, I know there's another book you can read about them in the younger days, and I haven't read it, but uh, there's something that they're completing in each other. So it's another thing that the book is about. Brett, you said uncertainty, and I think I said civilization. It's also about friendship. Yeah. You can see people like this where, you know, call my, what's the attraction of McRae to him? It might just be, when you read the book, the voice of Augustus McRae is what comes through most of the book. And it's a pleasure to listen to him theorize on everything. He's got an opinion on everything. He'll argue both sides of something. He'll argue just to hear himself talk. But it's fun. And I can imagine a young Woodrow Call meeting this guy from Tennessee who won't shut up. It's filling in the gaps where he doesn't know what to say. You, you might see couples like that. I mean, they're not a couple, but you know what I mean. Where the one is very quiet and the other one does all the talking. What is that thing they value that they share, you know, that gets them to a higher Aristotelian you know, level of friendship? Well, look, think about McRae. So McRae is on purpose lazy. And he says somewhere in the book that, you know, Jake Spoon and I have the same vices. It's a wonder I haven't been hung. Well, that's not quite true. But one of the things that Jake doesn't have is he doesn't have Woodrow Call. He doesn't have somebody who's going to do the right thing as he sees it all the time. If you are a lazy Epicurean like Augustus McRae, you should probably find somebody that you can attach yourself to. So you won't go too far uh, off the rails. I mean, I think, too, the thing that keeps them together is that shared experience. If you read the previous novels of fighting Comanches and Mexicans as young men. I mean, that was, they happened during a, uh, a formative part of their life. They have that shared experience. It's kind of like uh, military veterans a lot of way. They, no one else can relate to what they went through. They can't talk to any of these young guys and they're going to, those young guys aren't going to understand. Uh, they can't talk to the school moms and the bankers. They're not going to understand. Uh, so the only people they've got, or each other. That's it. They are compañeros. They say compañeros. Yeah. Yeah. Compañeros. Compadres. Well, speaking of friendship, Scott. Uh, so Jake Spoon was a compañero. That, as you mentioned, at a certain point, Woodrow and Gus hung him. And you said, "Wow, that was just wrong." Mm-mm. <laughs> they should have hung him earlier. They should have hung him earlier. Yeah. Do you think yeah. it's true that you ride with the the outlaw, you die with the outlaw? Well, that's what Gus said. That's a succinct statement. But when you when you read the book, he didn't just ride with them. Yeah. It was, I don't know, a week of riding and sleeping killing and settlers. killing and drinking. And like, you know, he had numerous opportunities to leave, kill the bad guys, do something. But uh, over the whole period of time he spent with them, he did not one redeeming thing at all. Uh, given right. time and time again, opportunity after opportunity, he did none of those things. 
Yeah, a passive character. So uh, McRae says that he's just like Spoon. Well, imagine if McRae had taken up with those killers. I think McRae would have been all right. He wouldn't have done it. I feel like Gus has some sort of moral compass. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something that Jake doesn't have. Well, I think he likes people. Yeah. You can see it with Lori. So he'll just go in and talk to her. So Lori's an interesting character. Um, She's had a rough time ending up in Lonesome Dove after being made to be a prostitute by, I forget the guy's name. Yeah. He, He would sell her out to his friends. So she's been abused. And she's only like 18. She's young. Yeah. But he'll just go and he'll get the poke. But sometimes he doesn't. He wants to talk to her. He wants to see her smile. He wants to uh, play cards with her. Uh, he finds people interesting. Like, uh, what's his name? Will? Uh, the guy that likes the sign. Yeah. Uh, when he dies at the end of the book and he just wants to talk to to Gus for a while. He enjoys his company. I don't get good conversation very much, and it's a pleasure to have yours. And he's a virtuous character. Yeah. For me, that was McRae's best feature. There isn't anybody he doesn't like where I don't think Jake likes anybody. So we should go back on the story. So Lori, this, she's this blonde goddess who somehow ends up in Lonesome Dove. Played by Diane Lane. Oh, yes. In the oh. <laughs> yeah, a, a young Diane Lane. She wants to get out of town. She wants to go. She's sick of the heat. You can imagine South Texas being sick of the heat. And she wants to go, where is it, San Francisco? Yep. And Jake promises her that he'll do it. So she attaches herself to Jake Spoon and says, you take take me with you. You know, he had just said it probably so that he could have a, have a, a, a girlfriend for the week that he's in Lonesome Dove. And so they set off on the journey, but they're going to ride with the cattle drive for a while. But Jake, we start to see the incompetence of Jake Spoon. He can't even set up his camp right. Uh, He gets a thorn in his hand. He goes off, where is it, San Antonio? He goes, I don't know these towns. He goes somewhere to go gamble and leaves her. And she gets taken by a Comanchero, by Blue Duck. And Jake's nowhere to be seen. And he doesn't seem to care when he finds out about it. That she was never of any real concern to him. But Gus goes to find her, goes to chase after her in this very, very bad guy. But when he finds her, so she's obviously she's she's had a real hard time. She doesn't want to talk to anybody. And that's where you start to see that's where you see more of Gus's character. He's just going to talk to her. He's just going to take care of her. He's just going to sit by her. She doesn't have to do anything. Uh, He's very kind to her. Yeah, she was even like, I'll give you all the pokes for free. I'll do anything. Mm -hmm. And Gus is like, no, you don't need to do that. We're just going to play cards. Yeah. This is all we're doing. I think that's the big difference. I mean, he liked her. Jake never liked her. She was a means to an end. Yeah, when they when they played cards, they were completely equals. And and she won. Like he respected her, I think her intellect, and she somehow maintained her individuality. And she, Clara is a virtuous character. The other rancher, doggone it, I forget his name, the one that was killed on the plains. But Lorena is a good person who has done bad things. And I I don't know, I don't know in real life how how long you can do bad things and still be a good person. <laughs> You know, we have uh, we have six months to repent of our heresies. I don't know. Like, I don't know what the over-under on that is. But she's portrayed that way. Right? Yeah. Like, her body does some things, and people do things to her body. But that inner Lori part is, is somehow okay and comes out okay. I don't know about that. Can you be a hardcore prostitute in a border town in 1868 Texas and still be piping hot, like, for four years, four years in? Like, like th- these things change people inwardly and outwardly, you know. And uh, I don't know. So that that part of the story was less than believable too. Yeah, and too. Lori's got a problem that. Well, I was chatting with a guy at the gym yesterday about this. Imagine the trouble that you would have if you were an honest to goodness ten on the scale of one to ten. 
Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I barely get through the day. I mean, nobody would ever tell you the truth. So I want to read this bit. This is from 544. They've gotten Lori back. And Lori's having coffee. So Augustus handed her a cup of coffee, and she held it in both hands, the smoke drifting in front of her face. Newt was sure he had never seen anyone as beautiful as her. That he was getting to share breakfast with her was like a miracle. Yeah. Which is kind of true you know it's, it's it that's the experience of beauty from the male point of view yeah but you said 10 like if if they hadn't cast diane lane you know we, we don't know like how many how many ladies are in lonesome dove how how many ladies are between you saying she gets a three-point bump the, the rounding might be pretty heavy <laughs> you know i mean i think too like i mean are we talking about so like people back then no, no one was really attractive back then. <laughs> I mean, if you, I mean, if you look at these pictures from the 19th century, and yet they reproduced. People had hard lives, and so I guess it was all relative. I mean, Lori was probably more attractive than Louisa by a long shot. I don't know. I mean, I, every time I look at old old pictures in the 19th century, I'm like, man, everyone was just rough looking, just yeah. really rough looking. Yeah. Well, you also, in fairness, you had to stay very still for the camera. Yeah. You, yeah, you can't you really sung out, You hung out in the sun all day, worked, sweat, wrinkles, had stress, farm, you know. Cr- so, your crops got just laid to waste one season, kids starving, lost three kids yeah. before they're age three. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wear you down. You're going to have crow's feet when you're 25. Yeah, poor Clara. Poor Clara. All right, so she has the hot girl problem, though. All right, let's say she's a six in modern scale. I don't know, whatever. But but she's the best thing they've ever seen. And she's got all these cowboys around her that they are only looking at her through that lens. And so her perception of men is men are the ones that use me or that see me as something for use. Yeah. And a lot of these men have... I don't know, honorable intentions. Like, Dish wants to marry her. Yeah, but he paid for her first. Well, yeah, because but that, that's really the only way you can spend time with her. You can't court this girl. You can't, like, you can't be like, hey, I'll pick you up and we'll go for a ride in my Surrey on Sunday morning. Like, you can't do that with this, this lady. That ruined his chances. He didn't maintain frame, you see, Brett. When he when he paid her, he did he did, wasn't maintaining frame. He had a sarge. Yeah, she he was simping for her all along, and as a result, this, you know, the, her asking him to pay was like the, the ultimate shit test, and he failed. This is online great books and PUA That's with right. Scott Hambrick. That's right. <laughs> Two dollars for a poke is the worst ST. That's the heaviest ST you'll ever have to pass. That's that's rough. Uh, Clara, you guys have been saying that she's the the virtuous one. I think so. She's got a husband that's comatose. He got kicked by a horse. Got kicked by a horse. Basically, he's a vegetable. She stands by him, like to the very end. That's admirable. Clara marries this Bob, and everybody, including Clara, although she doesn't say it out loud, I don't think, didn't really think much of Bob. He was a hard worker and probably honest, but not very clever and probably a little prideful. Clara is very bright and in you know needs conversation, needs to have her mind acknowledged, <laughs> and and he can't he can't or won't do that. Uh, in the story she tells about going days and weeks without him really saying anything. And because of his pride and his, um, you know, he's, he's classic midwit. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. He's working with an animal. They tell him they shouldn't work with and they kicked him in the head and uh, put him in a coma and he wastes away over the weeks. And she takes care of him dutifully while he's wasting away. But, and she, but she knew all of these things about him. If she lacks in virtue somewhere, I wonder if it's in marrying him. I'm not saying it is, but I wonder if that's where it is, because 
She knew of the difficulties that would be there. She knew of his shortcomings. She was wide-eyed about all of it. But maybe I just have a modern conception of what marriage is, and maybe it was the kind of an, an economic partnership that that she had to have, and maybe it maybe it was proper to do. I, I don't know. Well, if she had married Gus, what would have been the the downside of that? Well, uh, let me count the ways. Like I, I can't yeah, think of yeah. anything that would have gone right. Yeah. So he wouldn't have settled. He how long would he have stayed there? Uh, would he have been happy not traveling, not, uh, I don't know, would he have been too lazy? Would he have been lazy for her? I think he just would have, he would have been gone all the time. Like, he would have been, if Call said, hey, we're going out, we're going to go find this band of Com- Comanches that raided this town, would you be like, or Call, or Augustus would be like, yeah, all right, we're going. Because I think that's just part of who he is. Like, he needs that. Like, he's he a rambling needs to man. Do that. He's got a, he's got a mosey. He's a, <laughs> yeah, Can't I I, but I think I mean okay. I, and Claire, I think that was smart of Clara, though. Then I mean, it's okay. It wasn't I, uh, Bob's not ideal. Yeah, not marrying Gus doesn't equal marrying Bob. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and it, it reminds me of like you re- hear about guys who are in special forces, right? Like Navy SEAL types, Army Rangers. They got a lot of marital problems. Not all. Not a, not everyone has marital problems, but like they have a lot of marital problems because. It's the nature of the job. They got to be gone all the time. They go training, then they got to go to Afghanistan and, you know, kill somebody and then <laughs> come back. I, I mean, whatever that is, they do. And that, I mean, and that's hard on a marriage. Sure. And if your job is, I was going to say adrenaline junkie, you know, if, then then to come home and tend the farm and not get shot at, this might not be enough. Yeah.